Hello and welcome. My name is Daphna Adler and I'm one of the counselors here at Los Altos High School. And I'm really excited to present today our session on studying in Asia. This is part of our International Univ University Month series through the month of October. We are in our last week and um, this is a really great workshop for students who are interested in um, going somewhere. Um, like most of our students, I think, kind of look at Europe and like, it's not the only place out there. And so we really want to make sure that students are aware of options um, really throughout the world. And so it is great to present four different universities that are located in Asia. We have two institutions in China and two in Japan today. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panel and then turn it over to them. And they're going to tell you about studying in their countries and at their universities. So we have today Kelly Nuibe from Temple University in Japan, which is in Tokyo. Um, and we have Bethany Kanda from Ritsu Maikan Asia Pacific University. Did I say it right? I hope I said it right. <laughs> and then Dan Lover from NYU Shanghai um, and Lindsay Parker from Duke Kunshan University. Um, and Lindsay is going to uh, kick us off today. Thanks so much for, to all of you for being here. Thank you, Daphna. Um, so welcome to five reasons to study in Asia. And my name is Lindsay Parker, as Daphna introduced. I am a global recruitment officer for Duke Quinshan University, which is Duke University's new joint venture university in China. But before I show you anything about DKU, why should you consider studying in Asia? So here are five reasons why I would recommend. Number one is know all your options. I don't know about you, but when I go to a restaurant, I don't just look at half the menu before I order. I want to see the whole thing so I know all of my options. And picking out where you go to college is a lot more important than you know tacos versus burrito. So Likewise, if you only look at options in your home country, you could be missing out on some incredible opportunities. Number two is save money. One of the most common misconceptions about studying abroad is that it is always expensive. What some students don't realize is that it is often possible to study overseas, travel expenses included, for less than what they would pay to study at their home institution. The surprisingly affordable cost of living in some Asian countries makes destinations like China and Thailand, for example, great choices for the budget-minded. At DKU, for example, our students are paying about $10,000 less per year than the average cost of living for college students in the United States. Number three is you'll see more of the world for less money. Asian countries are uniquely suited for student travel as there are so many places that you can explore on a shoestring budget. But if you're a college student in the United States, you would likely blow your whole budget and half of your vacation time just getting there and back. If you're already living in Asia, you can hop on over on a cheap flight and really take advantage of your strategic location. So for example, the DKU student in this photo she took a star of the moment trip to the Philippines over just a three day weekend. Um, and this is her photo from the top of a volcano. Number four is actually learn that language. You've heard it a million times and it is true. The only way to really learn a language is to be immersed and use it daily. If your language of choice is Chinese, Japanese, or Malay, consider it doubly true. I took nearly seven years of Japanese language classes before I moved to Japan. And let me tell you, during my first few months on the ground, I felt like I had the communication skills of a toddler. But fast forward about six months and I was talking to everyone. To this day, communicating effectively in foreign languages is one of my favorite and most gratifying things to do. Number five is get ahead of the curve. According to McKinsey and Company, Asia is on track to top 50% of global GDP by 2040 and drive 40% of the world's consumption, 
representing a real shift in the world's center of gravity. And the simple fact that you guys are here in this info session right now probably means that you've noticed something like this is going on. Basically, if you are an American who graduates from college five or so years from now with a strong and nuanced understanding of the increasingly important roles that Asian countries are playing on the world stage, and you couple that with demonstrated cross-cultural competence and maybe even high need language skills, you will be one of the few college graduates who can meet the growing demand, which means higher pay and more attractive positions. So those are my top five reasons. So next I'd like to give you a little overview of what Duke Quinshan University is. As I mentioned before, we are Duke University's new joint venture university in China. And what we're offering is essentially a Duke Education 2.0 that's taught in English in China to top international students from all around the world. We are a partnership between Duke University, which is currently ranked number nine in the top best US colleges, and Wuhan University, which is in China's top 10, and the city of Quinshan. So this is what the city of Quinshan looks like. It's about 2 million people, and it's one of the greenest and wealthiest cities in all of China. This is where our campus is located, and it's an emerging technology and innovation hub, much like early Silicon Valley. From here, it's about 20 minutes on the high-speed train to Shanghai, one of the biggest and most international hubs in the entire world. Also, in contrast to these big, beautiful modern cities, we're located about 30 minutes away from China's historic water towns like this one. So this is somewhere that our students really love to go to uh, interact with locals that are leading a slower pace of life and a lifestyle that reflects more of the um, traditions of historic China. Our flagship study away is the study away at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. So typically during part of the junior year, students will come to Duke in North Carolina. They'll live on campus, they'll take Duke classes, um, and basically have as much of the full Duke experience as we can provide in a short term. Um, so they are studying on those two campuses, both in Quinchon, China and North Carolina in the United States. And they graduate with two degrees, a Chinese degree from Duke Quinchon University and a US bachelor's degree from Duke. We do have a radically different student demographics than what you would find in the US. So we're about 70% Chinese nationals and 30% international. We'll be about 2000 undergraduates when we're at full capacity. And we have over 60 different countries and nationalities represented within those international students. So we are very internationally diverse. Here's a quick look at our majors. They are all interdisciplinary dual majors that are pre-packaged together, kind of like a double major. So if you are eager for a global career, like foreign affairs, diplomacy, international law and public policy, even international business, or you're just super interested in China and the Chinese language, or you want to be on the leading edge of innovation and technology, like in data science, AI, or cybersecurity, um, we have some great major combinations for you here. So I don't know if we have any juniors, sophomores, or freshmen watching, um, but I am afraid for seniors, this is probably off the table for this current academic year. But in a normal year, when we're not facing extreme travel restrictions, if you apply to DKU and you get accepted, we actually offer to fly you to China in late April. And for a four day long weekend, uh, put you up in a nice hotel, give you tours of the campus and the local area, 
um, you would take sample classes from our professors and basically have that time to give DKU a test drive, see if it feels like a good fit for you. And that all takes place before the deadline to decide if you commit or if you want to go somewhere else. Um, so again, this is probably not going to be feasible for this year, um, but we're really excited to get this going up again um, once travel has opened back up and is safe again. So this is the quick version, but if you would like to get some emails from us um, and probably a nice little t-shirt mailer package in the mail um, and find out more about how you can take a full length info session um, and learn even more about this wonderful university. Um, this QR code will lead to a really short sign up where you can indicate your interest and we'll keep in touch with you. So thanks so much. And I'll hand it off to the next university. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, let me just pull up my screen. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Actually, on your side, uh, my name is Kelly New eBay. It's like the new eBay. Very easy to remember that way. Uh, I am Japanese American, born and raised in Hawaii. My whole dream was to go abroad uh, and you know, basically, once I got to Japan, I didn't leave. Um, and it's so funny because we have so many similarities on this panel. Uh, Lindsay and I were former Jets. So if you guys want to know about career opportunities in Japan as a teacher, definitely can ask us more questions after this uh, panel. Um, again, my name is Kelly. I represent Temple University Japan campus TUJ for short. We are in Japan. Our main campus is in Philadelphia on the east coast of the US. We also have a second campus in Rome, Italy, and then there's our third campus in Tokyo. We are fully accredited by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education in the US. So what does that mean? It means you are earning an American degree. You are able to go to all three campuses. You are also able to take advantage of any of our study abroad at campuses around the world. We also have several partnerships with Japanese universities in Tokyo, including one that's right across the street from us. So if I have any fluent Japanese speakers here, you are able to take classes in Japanese. And of course, because um, we are an American university, if you start off in California first and then transfer out, we will take those transfer credits um, and or you can come to Japan for all four years and earn your US degree here. Here are my key points on why students choose TUJ specifically. Number one is the quality education you have. I always tell students, get ready. You're going to have a lot of homework. You're going to be doing a lot of reading and writing, uh, but that's a good thing. That's what you pay tuition for. You're paying for that challenge. We want to make sure you are fully capable of handling uh, multitasking, um, time management, and being able to think critically, write uh, effectively, and persuade, and be able to discuss among your peers from all parts of the world, which is great segue to number two, students choose us because of the diversity. We have students from around the world and Lindsay, I believe, uh, you know, really said uh, that you, you, Asia is a gateway to anywhere um, and it's a really good place to travel. Um, so you are going to make friends from everywhere and it's so awesome. I myself have friends all over the world. I know I have a place to sleep if I ever go out and venture uh, in their neck of the woods. Third reason why students choose us is the study options. This looks like a small amount, but it is quite a comprehensive list. We are liberal arts based, so it is possible for you to apply as undeclared. It is also possible for you to change your majors later on. Most popular majors are international business studies, international affairs, communication studies, which has a film production track, as well as journalism art. Um, art is a BA in art, so we don't do a portfolio review. It's a really fun major because if you want to graduate, uh, you get to have your own gallery in Tokyo, and you have to do everything from the beginning, from finding the venue to, uh, what is the word, marketing, marketing the, the exhibit, and then putting it on and selling your work. 
fourth reason, as Lindsay had mentioned, and you're going to see this across all the universities you see here today, is affordability. It is quite a good option to consider when you are going abroad. Here is TUJ's tuition for one year, 15,000 US dollars. We charge the same rate for all students, regardless of your residence, regardless of your citizenship. This is quite affordable when you compare us to an out-of-state university and a private university on the low end. Because we are an American university, we also accept financial aid. So if there are any seniors, you know, it's October, FAFSA is open, go ahead uh, and start your application. We also accept GI Bill benefits for any veteran families online. And then, of course, you know, if you're not eligible for those, you, you can still use merit-based scholarships. Here is a quick look. You can take a screenshot of this and refer to it later. Uh, check out those QR codes to the website. It has all the details that you need to know about FAFSA, GI Bill benefits, and merit-based scholarships. And here are a quick list of our application checklist. I'll go into detail that in for that for the next slide, as well as our eligibility requirements and our deadlines. To apply, it's like applying to any American university. We do have the Common App, so if you want to use the Common App, you can do that. Otherwise, you can apply directly. Just make sure you are selecting the Japan campus, because as I said, we do have multiple campuses. If you are a native English speaker, you can apply as test optional, no problem. If I have any non-native English speakers here, um, you will have to submit a test score. Fifth reason why students choose this is the career prep. How awesome is it to say that you have work experience abroad. Tokyo is a very international city that hosts a lot of companies that are global. It includes Amazon um, and probably some that you might recognize like Square Enix, um, to name a few. And even places like Texas Instruments, which makes those graphing calculators you guys all use. Um, so it is such a great opportunity. We do a really good job with pairing students with internship opportunities, as well as gearing up for full time employment. If you're looking to connect with students, be sure to check us on social media. That's my advice to you all here, um, especially since you can't travel right now to China or Japan. Uh, following us on social media is a really good way to see what the universities are up to. Or you can catch my team on the virtual road. We have webinars every month. The next one that's coming up is going to be tea time with our students and our coordinator of activities. So you'll get to see what students do in their free time. Here is our email address. Our inbox accepts emails 24 seven. Um, I can't answer right away, but I definitely will when I wake up. It's not a problem. I'm here to help you. So always ask questions, never be afraid to reach out for help. And one last thing, I'm gonna take off my screen so I can share one more part and hopefully I can do this in a smooth way, hang on is to show you the activities because you know Lindsay brought up a good point about when you're ordering food you want to know what you're ordering and there's so many selections you want to look through the menu for me personally I want to look at pictures um, so this is a good way to look we have our Temple Univ Japan uh, campus uh, Instagram we also have TUJ activities so an activities page dedicated entirely to our field trips and events for example we had a virtual event that had that taught students how to meditate, which is pretty cool. Um, and then just this past weekend, our students went on a secret, not so secret, hiking trip to Gunma. So we don't just keep you in Tokyo, we take you to other neighboring prefectures. And that's what I love about Japan is that you can easily hop on a train and be in a countryside. You can be in a new world, a new environment. So awesome, definitely check us out. I'll type my information in the chat just for your uh, uh, reference. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, you can let us know. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna stop my presentation. Again, my name is Kelly New Ibe from Temple University Japan campus in Tokyo. We are now gonna go over to uh, the west side of Japan uh, to Beppu. So Beth. Thank you, Kelly. So like Kelly was mentioning, there's a lot of uh, things in common with us on this panel. So from Lindsay to Kelly, so from Kelly to me, I'm also from Hawaii. I was born and raised in Hawaii and I 
after graduating high school, I studied in Japan at this school that I'm going to be talking about. So if anyone has any questions uh, about APU, about Ritsumeikan on Asia Pacific University from the student standpoint, please also feel free to ask because I did experience it myself. So like I mentioned, my name is Bethany and I am a regional admissions counselor for APU. I'm based in the US. So if you do send me an email, I should be able to get back to you in a timely manner. Okay, so uh, about APU, we were founded in the year 2000. We're a rather new university, but we were founded on the principle of being a truly global university or an international university. Um, and so what that means is we wanted our student body to not be just Japanese students with a few exchange students, but fully a lot of Japanese students, a lot of international students so that they could learn from each other. So our campus is located on a hillside overlooking Beppu City down here. We do have on-campus housing and it's about a 10 minute walk to where our classrooms are. It's a straight shot, you can't get lost. You can't use that as an excuse if you're ever late to class, but it's great because you do see a lot of friendly faces every day as you're passing to and from uh, all your classes. We have a student body of about 5,700 students, our full-time students, and majority of these students are doing a four-year bachelor's program. So like I mentioned, we do want to keep our students uh, in an environment where they're meeting both international students and Japanese students. So we keep our ratio of students at about 50%. So uh, you'll be studying with, of course, Japanese students, but you'll also be studying with students from around the world, about 90 countries uh, currently represented on campus. And our faculty as well, we like to keep that same principle. So our faculty are both Japanese and international faculty. And the great part about this is even after graduation, you'll have friends from around the world. So like Kelly mentioned, you can travel anywhere. You'll probably have a friend in that country. You could stay at their place. They could take you to all the tourist destinations, but it's also great for business opportunities after graduation. So if you wanna work in a different country, you usually have a friend there who can tell you about the business culture, kind of help you to put your foot or get, get your toe in the water uh, in whichever country you're looking to move to. So at APU, we teach entirely in English and Japanese. So if you don't have any Japanese background, that's not an issue. You can take all of your courses in English. If you're fluent in Japanese and you prefer that language, you could take all of your classes in Japanese. Uh, in addition to that, we do require students to take the opposite language. So if you're studying in English, we do require you to take Japanese, about one year of Japanese with us, which should get you to about an intermediate level. We also offer higher level Japanese on top of that, which is listed here. So if you do want to work in Japan or if you want to work using the language, we do uh, offer these levels to get you to that level of high fluency. In addition to that, there's six other languages you can take as an elective. So by the time you graduate, you should have English, Japanese, and maybe even a third language under your, under your belt to make you competitive in the workforce. For our majors, we actually only have two colleges. So two majors, one is our Asia Pacific Studies, which is a social studies uh, degree or international management, which is our business administration degree. So when you apply to APU, you just have to pick either of the college, which one you're interested in, but you don't have to pick a major at that time. You can kind of take courses in the lower levels, kind of find your interests or what field you want to pursue. And then as you work your way through uh, the program, take more and more in-depth uh, courses in one area that will be your major. In addition to studying in Japan, you can also study abroad abroad. So another country, we have tons of exchange program opportunities in China as well, uh, in a lot of the English speaking countries in Europe or even uh, non English speaking countries throughout Europe and uh, even Africa, those kinds of places if you're interested. If you don't want to do a full semester or year, we also offer field studies or internships that you could do during our vacation in between the semesters to really supplement your time at APU. So uh, in Japan, students will start job hunting during their fourth year. Uh, and what that usually entails is flying out to companies, going to all their info sessions, interviews, things like that. Uh, but because we are located a little while out, uh, out of Tokyo, we ask companies to visit our campus. And we have over 250 companies visiting APU to recruit students for spots open for APU students. 
And the reason they do this is because of APU students' unique background. They speak multiple languages. They've spent four years on a campus with students from around the world. So when it comes to cultural understanding, adaptability, being able to share your opinion, but also compromise, those kinds of skill sets, uh, APU students have tons of experience. And that's what a lot of companies are looking for. So just a short list of some of the employers, tons of different industries. We have tech, we have consulting, banking, gaming. Uh, really, there's no limit to what kind of industry you can get into after studying, not just at AP, but at a lot of universities in Japan. And about 10% of our students do go on to study uh, at a graduate school after graduating uh, from APU. And here is a short list of some of those destinations as well. So outside of class, APU's campus is always, always vibrant. We have tons of activities happening at any time. If you want to see more, please look us up on all of the social medias. Uh, we're on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. We have a lot more content that'll show how active uh, our campus is. Uh, tons of club opportunities, anything from sports to dance to business case competitions, academic clubs, anything that you're interested in, hopefully we do have something for you. And there's also opportunities to work part-time on campus if that interests you. So like I mentioned, we have on-campus housing, two styles of room, single, uh, single room and a shared room. Uh, all first year students can live in on-campus housing. It is fully furnished. You even get sheets. So you get to move in ready and you don't have to buy furniture or anything. Uh, you can live there for the entire year and never have to buy something for your apartment. So we are located in Beppu. It's a small city of about 120,000 people. As you can see here, it's kind of like a seaside tourist town about an hour's flight from Tokyo. I like to say that it's suburban. We have multiple Starbucks, multiple McDonald's, a lot of restaurants. There's a nightlife as well. So it is slower in terms of the style of living compared to places like Tokyo, but it is very comfortable and affordable because it is on the smaller side. Just some fun facts. Uh, we are famous in Beppu for our hot springs. We have over 2000 and it's actually second highest uh, in terms of volume for hot spring water, second only to Yellowstone National Park. And for any anime fans out there, the anime Demon Slayer, the artist who draws it is actually from the area uh, around Beppu. And so a lot of the scenery really looks like Beppu and even the shrine that we have in Beppu appears in the anime. So if you are watching it or if you've seen it, be on the lookout for this shrine. In tuition, uh, we have our tuition here. It's about 11,300 for your first year. And then from your second year on each year, about 13,000. So like everyone else has mentioned, it is very affordable to study in Asia. This is the tuition that everyone pays regardless of nationality or citizenship. Um, and then we do offer scholarships on top of this. So at APU, we offer a tuition reduction scholarship of 30 to 100% off of that amount that I showed. It is based on your application. So whatever you submit during the application process, we'll screen that and we'll tell you your results at the same time you get your admissions results. And your scholarship is good until your time of graduation. So if you're coming in as a first year student, they'll be good for all four years you're with us. So to apply, we have our own application online. We're accepting applications now. Uh, you fill in your application information, you pay the application fee, and we do an online assessment. And then if you wanna do, uh, if you wanna apply for the scholarship, you also have to do an interview with us like this through Zoom for about 20 minutes, uh, and then you'll get your results. So for more information about the application, feel free to take a screenshot or use this QR code. The link is also listed right there. And again, all of our social media accounts, just type in Reads Make on APU, we should pop up. And that is it. My name again is Bethany. Feel free to take a screenshot picture if you wanna contact me later. Uh, and that is it. So I will end here and pass it on to the next person of presenting. All right, well, uh, I guess up up next, my name is Dan, part of the NYU Shanghai uh, admissions team. Uh, excited today to share a little bit of information uh, about NYU Shanghai with you all today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about NYU Shanghai from the perspective of, of living and learning in China uh, and walk you through what our students are kind of going through as they're going through this experience uh, of continuing their education in China. And the first 
question that I want you to think about is think about China. And I want you to think about what are some of the images that come to mind? I often hear a lot of students say they think of something along the lines of this middle image, in which case this is Shanghai, a little bit more of the urban image uh, that you often see. And then of course, if you look at my virtual background, this is the famous Shanghai skyline here. But I want you to also think about the fact that China looks very different depending on where you are. Um, this little bit more Confucius history on the right um, is also something um, that you can find uh, within a city like Shanghai if you're in different parts of the city. And then of course, as soon as you step out of the cities, there are beautiful expanses of nature. Um, you can, uh, if you go to Northern China, to places like Harbin over the winter, you can find ice sculpture festivals. You can find deserts uh, in China. Uh, if you go to the South, you'll find palm trees and more tropical climates and just such a diversity of, of different places and people and dialects and, and so much to see. Um, and there really, so there really is a lot to, to explore um, you know, within, uh, within just China itself. And when students first arrive in China, the majority of our students uh, have never been to China. Um, of course, for uh, half of our students, they have been. Half of our students do come from all over China. They are the Chinese national population, but the rest come from about 70 or so uh, different countries. And our international student population in the beginning often find themselves fumbling to maybe order in Chinese for the first time or navigating the city. But you know, quickly it all becomes um, you know, quite smooth. Uh, they realize living in Shanghai, uh, it's a very much an easy to navigate city. Um, there's a lot of resources in place. And the summer before you arrive at NYU Shanghai, you'll meet an orientation ambassador who's an upperclassman who's been through the process. They lead you through that orientation process, helping you get settled in your new home. Um, you'll meet your classmates uh, through a Facebook group, uh, academic advisors to help you get uh, started on your academic journeys, get that all planned out. Uh, and then when you arrive, you'll also have um, you know, great connections to be made uh, in the residential space. And this is where a lot of the bonds really do form from an early stage. We pair Chinese students with international roommates. Um, and, and this is very much a place where a lot of connections are, are made. I, you know, talked to a student named Farheen from Pakistan who really connected, you know, with her student, uh, with her, uh, her roommate Jai from China. Uh, they've, you know, spent many late nights chatting about various topics, doing homework together, um, you know, learning each other's languages, um, uh, learning about each other's cultures. Um, Farheen's actually got home with, with Jai for, uh, to celebrate Chinese New Year to, to her home in China. Um, and her roommates come home with her uh, to her home in Pakistan. And this is just one of many examples. I've heard of so many students traveling around China together, traveling around Asia together. Uh, and then throughout all of it, you have your RA or residential assistant to you know, help you um, it, as a go-to kind of guide in the residential space. I often hear about them organizing a number of fun social events, you know, help you kind of explore the city. And ultimately, as my, you know, uh, as uh, Lindsay has said before, and, and as I think is really true, it can't be said enough, language immersion, being immersed in Chinese language on a regular basis is just so important. I studied Chinese in the U.S., um, in high school, and in college. Um, but it wasn't until I actually spent an extended period of time in China, I spent three years working in China, did I realize, wow, um, when I'm just immersed in it on a regular basis and I, I don't have to force myself to integrate it into my life, um, it's just huge in terms of allowing you to improve very quickly. And our students are realizing this. They're leaving their uh, class and they're going to a restaurant, getting on the subway. Any day-to-day -day life activities can involve speaking Chinese. Um, and our students are, are getting to a very high level very quickly. I was talking uh, to a student named Stephanie who's doing um, uh, research in, China, in Chinese on how the uh, pandemic has impacted women's rights throughout China. Uh, students are using their intern, um, Chinese in their internships. Uh, we have trips to more rural parts of China where students are uh, conducting interviews in Chinese with, uh, with the local community. Very much in, in engaging and using their Chinese in a number of you know, really um, you know, really compelling ways, getting to a high level very quickly. And if you're more advanced, we have courses like reading a Chinese newspaper, doing business in Chinese, uh, classical Chinese. We recently added a course on discussing documentary films uh, in Chinese. So wherever you're at, there really is a course for you. And I can tell you, though, the majority of our students do come in starting at, at a very, you know, the elementary level, essentially. So if you are thinking, oh, no, you know, maybe this isn't for me, I have no Chinese language experience or very little, um, I would encourage you to, to second think that and, and realize you can improve very quickly. I've seen students come in with no Chinese and leave, you know, ready to use their Chinese in the work world after graduation. 
Um, and Shanghai is just a really easy to city, city to navigate, as I mentioned before, and a big reason is the subway system. So fun fact, Shanghai has the longest lines of metro of any city uh, in the world, and it is still rapidly expanding. Uh, we have a subway stop right near our current campus. We actually have a new campus, a little bit southwest of our, our current one, um, that is going to be set to be completed next summer. It's a beautiful building, very interconnected, green space throughout, wraps around this quad. Uh, and it's also going to have a subway stop uh, right by uh, campus as well. So very easy to, to stay connected um, and really make the city an extension of your experience at NYU Shanghai. Um, you know, as many of you know, we started in New York City and we've always been about an urban experience uh, at NYU and, and, you know, whether it's in Manhattan, uh, our other campus in Abu Dhabi, in Shanghai or other locations around the world where students can study, um, you very much are integrated uh, into the city. But there are also other things to explore, you know, within Shanghai, you might maybe are most you know, familiar with, again, this, this skyline that you see behind me, that's the Pudong district of Shanghai. Um, you know, east of the river, essentially Shanghai being split into Puxi and Pudong west and east of the river there. And uh, the Pudong side is very much the, you can think of it as like the financial economic hub uh, of Shanghai, where there is a wealth of professional development resources that our students are, are tapping into. Um, but if you go west uh, of the river, you'll find a little bit of a different vibe. Um, you'll see these, you know, more quiet tree-lined streets where students like to go to explore different parts of the different neighborhoods. They might find little concept cafes or small shops where they're picking up some kind of one-of-a-kind items, maybe just using it as a space to unwind, grab some bubble tea, connect with friends or family, do some homework. Um, so even within Shanghai, there's just a lot to explore, and there's always, you know, a number of things going on, uh, food festivals, uh, environmental conferences, uh, so many cool concerts with you know international artists from around the world touring and doing stops in China. There's really a lot to see. But of course, there's also a lot to explore outside of Shanghai as well. Uh, our students are going, um, doing trips to more rural parts of China to, for, for service or for language focused trips where they're conducting interviews um, with the local communities in Chinese or um, taking you know biking trips to, to more you know mountainous areas or just so many different things to, to explore. Uh, within China. Um, and China is also very connected through, uh, through its uh, rail system, which can get you pretty much anywhere you need to go. And um, of course, you know, flights are, are quite inexpensive as well. So really, really easy to kind of navigate the rest of China. Um, you know, every province of China is, you know, unique. There's different, you know, foods, different cultures, maybe different dialects of Chinese spoken. So there really is a lot to explore. And students are even going outside of China as well, flying, you know, to whether it be Philippines, Japan, um, Indonesia, or a wide variety of different places during breaks. When you're studying at NYU Shanghai, when you're studying anything in China uh, in general, you're not only becoming an emerging authority in whatever field you're studying, but also an emerging authority on China and China's role in that field. So if you're studying finance, well, what's going on in the Chinese financial markets? Um, you know, economics, you know, how's the Chinese economy been doing? Um, in terms of like green work, uh, you could focus on global public health within our social sciences major. There are so many exciting uh, green projects going on uh, throughout China and our Green Shanghai Club is one of our most popular clubs. They work with local organizations throughout the city to on a number of green projects like installing green roofs throughout the city. So, um, you know, it, artificial intelligence, there's so much work going on in AI and we have a whole research institute dedicated to, to artificial intelligence. So uh, whatever you might be interested in, you're, you're really learning about what's going on um, with, with China in that particular field. And, and this ultimately sets you up to be really successful uh, in, in an interconnected world in which China is playing a very large role uh, in so many different fields. Um, I've talked to students who, um, I talked to a student named Lauren, who was the first non-Chinese intern at this small little Chinese microloan company, using her Chinese in her internship and getting really um, key insight into Chinese professional culture. Um, and then outside of Shanghai as well, I've talked to a student named Frank, who is currently studying um, away at NYU in Washington, DC, and doing an internship on Capitol Hill and where he's seen as an authority on China, US relations and really doing research in that area. Um, so, you know, whether your goal is ultimately to you know, work in China after graduation as, as a number of our students are for top Chinese companies or, or offices of, of international organizations or um, go elsewhere. Um, they're really uh, having a deeper understanding of China uh, in addition to whatever field you're studying can really um, get you anywhere you, you might want to go. So with that, um, I hope you um, enjoyed this whole presentation. Thank you to all the other you know, speakers who joined today. And if you want to stay connected, here's my email address. You could uh, connect with us on social media. And uh, this QR code is just uh, our landing page for our upcoming events. So thank you very much.
Awesome. Thank you all so much. That was fantastic. And I'm so glad we've got Mrs. Chen, who's one of our Mandarin teachers and a group of students with us today. Um, so I'd love to get some questions from some of our students. Does anyone have any questions? This is a great opportunity. You've got four university reps here, um, captive audience, and they would love to um, answer any questions that anyone, anyone has. Don't be shy. Chances are, if you have a question, there might be other people wondering the same thing. Anybody or Mrs. Chen, any questions? <laughs> no? Okay. So um, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. So if students are interested in attending um, a inter I mean, university in Asia, how do they, are there any type of virtual tour that they can go check out the school before they fly to China or Japan? That's a great question. Who would like to chime in? I can we do have virtual tours on our website, yes. Yeah. Most, most universities do, especially now with COVID, um, most universities have put together some really great virtual tours um, in their admission section. Um, so students can like start there and see if they, you know, if they're interested in what they see. And then if their family can make a trip to Asia to visit universities, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah, I mean, we do have a 360 degree tour of, of our current campus building and some places throughout Shanghai. Complicated thing is our new campus is still being uh, constructed. So we don't, there's a number of really nice renderings you can find online of that as well. And of course, you know, as soon as we can, we'll get a nice kind of full full virtual tour of that going soon. Great. And then um, Lindsay put the link for the DKU virtual tours in the chat. Thank you. Um, and, and students, you know, I would suggest really getting onto their social media. Like every college has awesome social media nowadays, and it's one of the best ways to connect with them. So check out their Instagram, for example, they're gonna have lots of great photos and other links and, um, you know, all kinds of ways to connect with, with the university. So you really get a feel for what it might be like to be a student. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great way to connect. Any other last questions before we wrap up or any comments that anyone wants to add? Okay, um, one last thing I would like to mention, which is, and this is the case really for, for all international admissions so far, um, you can see that there is an actual face and a person behind every one of these institutions. Um, and that doesn't tend to be the case necessarily for US admissions, like sometimes, um, but um, with international universities, the admission representatives really, really want students and their parents to feel comfortable with this and to have all the information that they possibly can. You're going like halfway across the world and, and they're very aware of that and they really want um, applicants to know what they're walking into when they get off that plane. Um, you know, there's always like some homesickness and things like that. And we actually had a whole session about student life and how to thrive abroad. So you can check that out on the, the College Career Center website. Um, but you know, that's normal anywhere, um, but there's a lot of research that you can um, uh, that you can conduct on on their website and social media. But any other questions, please do reach out to them. Um, if you don't grab their information right now, reach out to me and I'm happy to connect you. Um, they're really more than happy to communicate with you. Um, and then I have a question in the chat. Um, is the application process the same as colleges in the US? Are there additional requirements needed? Great question. Anybody want to talk about that one? Yeah, I'll, well, I'll say every school is different. I know that's like a, when you hear that, you're like, no, that doesn't help me. Um, but it's so true. Uh, and so my advice that I give to all students is, is keep a diary. And I know that's also another weird thing. You're like, what? Dear diary. <laughs> um, but it really, it helps you journal and keep notes of, okay, this university wants an official transcript. This university has a received by date deadline. Uh, you know, this university is a day ahead, which is all four of us here. Um, so keep those notes uh, uh, and, you know, obviously you can Google it or, or use whatever search function you want, but it, 
in the end, when you're looking at a number of universities, um, it's going to take up too much time. And it's much easier if you already know, oh, I remember I wrote it in the corner of the page. Uh, that will help you find that and navigate through everything. Everyone has a different uh, way of applying to their schools. Some schools use the Common App, others don't. Others have a different platform. Um, it really does depend um, on the university specifically. Definitely. Um, and yeah, like Lindsay put in the in the chat, um, Common App for DKU, so that's super helpful. And if you're wondering if a school is on Common App, go to your Common App and just type in the school and it'll come up um, and then you can add it to your college list. Um, when all else fails, go to the website for the university to the applying section and you will find um, the application and uh, process and requirements there. And if there's anything unclear, these are your people that you want to contact. Um, you know, when you are applying internationally, it is true that it can be a bit complicated in terms of, you know, who, what do you submit to whom? Like, you know, when I'm working with students um, on UK universities, some of them want an official transcript, some of them don't. So it's a little bit difficult to, to navigate that sometimes. So that's why you want to give yourself time and be organized. So either a diary like Kelly suggested, or if you have like a master spreadsheet of all your colleges, um, you can have like an international section um, and have columns for like, you know, deadline and type of application, are there supplement essays, all those sorts of things. Um, so it really isn't that different from the American process necessarily, but there may be some extra steps. And so um, if you, if students give themselves enough time ahead to plan, order documents if you need them, et cetera, you're gonna be really just fine and ask questions. Don't, don't assume that it's going to be similar to the US process, because it may be but there might be some differences. So um, definitely ask and, and make sure that you know what you need. Um, let's see, a couple more things. Uh, do any of the schools do summer opportunities for high schoolers? Um, Lindsay responded, DKU doesn't have summer programs for high schoolers yet. However, I recommend signing up for emails to keep, um, to keep updated, yep. Um, okay, Temple is on Common App. Um, APU does have a summer program which was virtual this year, but in a traditional year, it would be on campus. That's cool. Um, and then this year we also have another program that includes mock lectures. So these things are evolving as we all kind of reemerge from COVID. Um, universities are um, kind of feeling it out and um, seeing what, you know, what is reasonable on campus, what are the um, travel rules within their countries, et cetera. So it's still evolving a little bit, which can be challenging. Um, but again, keep in touch with them, follow their social media, and they'll always like stay up to date with those things that way. Okay. Any other last questions? Really good questions, by the way. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you so much to all four of you um, for being with us. Um, and uh, for students and Ms. Chen for being with us today, really appreciate it. Um, this session is uh, recorded and will be available for students to view on the College Career Center YouTube channel shortly. Um, and of course, come and ask me any questions um, and I'm happy to connect you with anyone that you see here today. Thanks and have a great day, everyone. <laughs>